Good morning. My name is Katie Faldetta, and I am joined with uh, Michael McKnight and Chief Chris Lusner. We are from Cape May County, New Jersey. It is an incredibly small little county at the very bottom of New Jersey. We're very rural, and I think we're facing a lot of the same health challenges that a lot of you are experiencing in your own communities. We recently had the privilege to engage in a grant process that was funded through Robert Wood Johnson to look at what our health disparities were as a community. And there are lots of problems that we have, as I'm sure you have. We have an opioid epidemic, we have the highest cancer rates of any place else in our state, and we have the highest obesity rates of any place else in our state. But looking at all the data, the group determined that the real problem that we're facing is adverse childhood experiences. The effect of trauma on kids is creating the community that is essentially the, one of the worst places to live in New Jersey. And I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law is a federal prosecutor, and he prosecutes only horrible crimes for children. So terrible things you read in the paper about kids who have been molested or trafficked. His job is to sweep into a community where this has happened, interview everyone, and prosecute. And he's been doing this for 10 years, and he's got two adorable kids of his own. And I said, Austin, how in the world are you still doing this? Have you thought about maybe asking for a transfer to, like, taxation, something a little easier? And he said, you know, Katie, I just cannot sleep at night if I know that those perpetrators are not behind bars one less day than they can be. And he is very good at his job. He has very high rates of locking people up. I don't know what the real words are, but he is very good. And I share this story with you not to brag about my brother-in-law, but to emphasize the point that a lot of people in our community feel the same way he does, that something terrible happens to a child. And our job is to figure out what happened, arrest, put that person away, and now the situation's over and we've protected the community in a better way. But what you know and I know is that our work is really just beginning in that space. Because if we don't layer that child with community support, attachment, safety, then that kid in 20 years could be the perpetrator that he's coming back to look at again. We know from the ACEs study that trauma fundamentally changes the architecture of our brain. And if we can't address trauma with our kids, then we're looking at adversities for them in 20 years. And that's something we have to stop. We are the choir in this room. We all have bought into that Kool-Aid. And our job now is to tell everyone else in the world why this is our number one priority. It's our number one priority for four very simple reasons. Write these down, tell everyone who will listen to you why they should be concerned about this. Simply, you are changing lives. Focusing on children, layering support and community attachment is huge. It's building safer communities. It saves money in the long run. There are two studies that have come out in the last 12 years, one from CDC and one from SAMHSA. The CDC one says that for every dollar we spend on prevention, we save 16 in societal costs. And the SAMHSA one says that for every dollar we save 25 in societal costs. That is hospitalization, that is incarceration, that is everything that we don't want for our kids in the future. Finally, it expands and improves our workforce. No one wants to live and work in a community where they don't feel supported and loved. That's what we have to tell people. We need to support our kids so they stay, so they keep connected to what we have to offer. I work in substance abuse prevention. I have worked there in the last 22 years, and we have, Cape Assist is my agency, we have a staff of about 20, and we have, for the last 20, five, 30 years in our agency, focused on one model. We have focused on the risk and protective model that focuses on increasing protective factors and decreasing risk factors. Very simple. We look at a kid, we look at a community, and we say, what is the scaffolding around this kid that is going to keep them safe? And what are the things in this community that may keep them from engaging in risky behavior? What do their peers think? What do their parents think? And how do we change that so that kids are better supported and have more protective factors and less risk factors? What I love to share with you about this is that while we've been talking about it for the last 30 years or so, 
the language in the ACEs study is something that everyone can relate to. Everyone understands resiliency and everyone understands adversity. We've changed our language and I would encourage all of you to go out and tell everyone about this. Adversity is something everyone can understand. No one wants kids to suffer in adversity. Everyone wants kids to be resilient. And creating these common language spaces where we can bridge gaps in our community is what's going to keep everyone moving in the right direction. And I would encourage you to keep talking about this as much as you possibly can. So how we started was getting as many people around a table as possible. And when I said at the beginning, get everyone you can to listen to you, I mean that every single person you can. We have the library, we have the hospital, we have the Chamber of Commerce. No one person can do this alone. It takes multiple strategies over multiple sectors to impact kids. The trauma that they're experiencing today and that they're feeling today may not be seen for many, many, many years. And we want to layer those kids with as much support as possible. This is how we are building our trauma resilient community. At the top of this circle, you'll see strengthening resilience. That's a lot of what we do in schools. We talk to kids about increasing their sense of purpose, what are their goals. We try to also do that second space where it says restoring lives. That's about building connections, making sure kids are connected to you as humans. At the bottom, it's knowledge, it's that foundation. We want to educate everyone on why adversity needs to be addressed and why connection needs to be built at every sector of our community. And finally, over to the side where it says breaking cycles. I cannot stress how strongly we should be focusing on breaking the cycles of addiction. For any of you out there who have been in the same district for more than two generations, you're seeing the kids who are coming into your school are the, that are dysregulated are most likely the children of the parents that were dysregulated 20 years ago. That's not a coincidence. And it's not the parents' fault. We're seeing that in our addiction programs as well. People who are growing up in societies where they don't feel supported, in homes where they are not treated as, as a connection, treated as, as a whole, are repeating the same cycles that their parents were living in. And we have an opportunity to build something different, and we need to take advantage of that. Oh, I love this slide because it has cake on it. But it reminds me to tell you that no one can do this alone. We are all part of this delicious cake we are building. Chief Lusner is going to tell us about what he's doing with his sector. And I can tell you what I'm doing with my sector in terms of educating kids about their goal setting. But what I want to impart upon all of you is that it is not just your job. It is everyone's job, which is why we have to get everyone involved in this. We are building a delicious layered cake for our kids to enjoy. And we need to make sure that everyone is going in the same direction so that we can have something this beautiful. And I'm gonna end here and hand it over to Mike because he's got lots to say about the brain. But if anybody asks you why we're doing this, why we should be concerned about the health and well-being of our children, the connection that we need to build with them, this is what you say. It has been said that if child abuse and neglect were to disappear today, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual would shrink to the size of a pamphlet, and within two generations, our prisons would be empty. And that is true. Thank you. Hello, Indiana. Uh, my name's Michael McKnight. I want to tell you a little bit about my background. Prior to working for the Department of Education, which none of this work has come from, uh, I taught uh, emotionally disturbed adolescents for uh, uh, 13 years in three states. Um, and then I, uh, I had the privilege of becoming a principal at a, a special services district for all troubled kids, mostly kicked out of real schools, regular schools, uh, ages 5 to 21. Um, and I did that for uh, a little bit over a decade. I like telling people that's where when all my hair fell out. But uh, um, so, my, uh, so it's always fun to share uh, what, what 
kids taught me over that time. Uh, they will drive our learning if we allow them to. Um, and and uh, it's just an honor to be able to come out here to Indiana again and, and share some of the stuff that we're doing in New Jersey uh, to work with really, really hard kids. Um, I love... Um, Mandela's quote here, uh, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. So we're going to take a, a quick trip, really kind of fast, uh, around how things are, are moving and working. So a little bit about uh, brains as we start. Um, the brain develops vertically and sequentially from bottom to top over time. Brain architecture is comprised of billions of connections between individual neurons across different areas of the brain. The first structures of the brain to develop form the foundation <clears throat> for the next structures to grow. The brain is not fully developed until around 25, um, older for men if you can believe that. Uh, so none of us working in pre-K to 12 are working with a finished product. The brain's not done. Actually, the brain stays plastic for the rest of our lives. Every interaction you have with another human being uh, literally begins to rewire that part of the brain. Uh, the brain is a social organ. It's developed and changed in interaction with other brains. Uh, the organization of that developing brain occurs in the context of relationships with another self, another brain. This relationship context can be growth facilitating or growth inhibiting. And so it imprints in the developing right brain either a resiliency or a vulnerability. Every time you interact with a kid or a colleague, you're literally rewiring that brain. Uh, and it's kind of cool to think about as, as we, uh, we go about interacting with each other, um, with the students and, and, and professionals in our building. So a quick look at what, what's going on in America and in the context. I'm going to start big and get into Indiana. Every day in the United United States, four children are killed by abuse or neglect, seven children or teens commit suicide every day in America, eight children or teens are killed with a gun every day in the United States of America. Also every day, about 590 public school students are corporally punished, yeah, paddled in public schools. Uh, 19 states still allow paddling in our public schools. Anybody want to shout out a guess of which state paddles the most children in public schools in America? The winner is, uh, the best data I could find uh, was 2012. Mississippi won that year. Mississippi paddled over 30,000 kids in their public schools that year, um, uh, followed by Texas with over 25,000. In 2013-14, over 106,000 kids were paddled in public schools. Um, uh, Indiana still has paddling on the books, by the way. Uh, so so it's, in, it's interesting to kind of look at um, who are we punishing and how does that work. Um, over uh, every day in America, 2,800 kids are arrested. Uh, every day, about 2,800 kids drop out of high school in the United States. Um, and every day in America, over 12,000 kids are suspended from school. I want to introduce cycles of violence, if you haven't heard of them. In a typical year, about 3 million children in the United States uh, are reported to Child Protective Services as victims of maltreatment. It's absolutely no coincidence uh, that about 3 million children also come in contact with our juvenile justice system annually. Often these statistics are tracking the same kids at different stages of development. As we watch the news and sometimes we hear about children being abused or neglected, our hearts bleed. Uh, but these young people can go into a box, come out as adolescents, um, and, and uh, our hearts do not bleed as much when we see the results of their behavior as they get older. Uh, but we now know uh, 
that being abused or neglected as a child increases the likelihood of arrest as a juvenile by almost 60%, as an adult by 28%, and for violent crimes by 30%. <clears throat> Maltreated children were younger at the first time of their arrest, committed nearly twice as many offenses, and were arrested more frequently than other children. <clears throat> what we're starting to talk about in New Jersey is pain-based behavior. And just to give you a sense of the connection between pain and behavior, 73% of girls in the juvenile justice system have a history of sexual abuse and physical abuse. The term pain-based behavior refers to destructive or defensive reactions triggered by negative emotional uh, uh, states. Your most difficult troubled kids are kids in pain, um, and we need to shift that language intentionally. A troubled youngster may act out outwardly or inwardly, but the core experiences for both kinds of behavior is pain. Describing such troubling emotions as pain is more than a figure of speech. Negative emotional experiences, like rejection, activate pain centers in the brain, just as physical pain activates centers in the brain. Other things going on in the richest country in the world, many of our systems are overwhelmed. On any given day, nearly 443 children are in foster care in the United States. In 2017, more than 690,000 children spent time in U.S. foster care. Also in 17, one-third of children entering foster care were children of color. Other things getting closer to home, um, in Indiana, uh, public school data reported to the U.S. Department of Ed in 1617 in your state school year shows that an estimated 17,000 kids um, experienced homelessness in that year. So I want you to think of, as, you, as you're thinking of these horrible statistics, stressed families have stressed kids. Um, and these statistics I want you to link with the, the amount of stress kids are carrying into our schools and classrooms every day. Um, other things happen in, in Indiana. Uh, Indiana youth are significantly more likely to consider suicide uh, than their peers nationally. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth in your state, 15 to 24, and the fourth leading cause of death for kids 5 to 14 um, in Indiana. Uh, one in five Indiana high school students seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year. Youth who are identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual are three times as likely to consider suicide and five times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers. Um, and also females are twice as likely to commit suicide as their males, as males. You guys are more than aware of the opioid epidemic that not only is affecting your state but many other states. Again, stressed families with stressed kids. Uh, toxic levels of stress in the soil that our kids are growing up in uh, as we move along. <clears throat> um, Child abuse and neglect in Indiana. Um, in, uh, from 2017, um, Indiana had uh, 29,198 reported uh, confirmed child abuse victims. Uh, that amounts to about 18.6 victims for every 1,000 kids uh, in your state. Uh, the number is second only to Kentucky. Uh, and it meant Indiana's child abuse rate was more than twice the national average, uh, uh, which was 9.1 to 1,000 kids. Uh, again, stressed kids, stressed soil, stressed families. Toxic levels of stress are not just about other people's children, though. Uh, in 2015, how many of you guys with your show of hands have your own kids at home? Yeah. Uh, in 2015, about 3 million teens aged 12 to 17 have had at least one major depressive episode in the past year. 
More than two million reported experiencing depression that impairs their daily function. About 30% of girls and 20% of boys, totaling 6.3 million teens, have an anxiety disorder. We're seeing it more and more. I also get to adjunct at a college level, um, seeing more and more of that with our, 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 our really kids that are in their young 20s carrying in all kinds of anxiety, dis depression, uh, and stress. Um, certainly, um, uh, what's kind of cool about being in this room uh, that, that uh, we all know about the ACEs study. Uh, and that's kind of cool, and uh, there's still many pockets that don't. Uh, so I encourage you to get out there and spread that. Uh, but it's kind of neat to be with colleagues for a few days where everybody at least knows what this stuff is, what stress does to kids' brains and their bodies. Um, according to the Center for Health Policy at Indiana University, Indiana is exceeding national rankings for any ACE event. Uh, nearly half of, the, of Indiana's children have experienced one or more ACEs. Indiana youth have a higher prevalence than their peers nationally in eight out of nine ACEs measured by the National Survey of Children and Health. Uh, it's also been fun to visit other states, um, and your state has an awful lot of kids uh, that are growing up in toxic levels of soil uh, and carrying that into our schools uh, and really Really, what, what is that? Well, what are we leading to? Uh, certainly, we're talking about trauma. Um, uh, so, um, what is trauma? I, I like Perry's definition, Dr. Bruce Perry, a psychologically uh, distressing event that is outside the range of usual human experience, often involving a sense of intense fear, terror, or hopelessness. Um, when you look at the original word trauma, it comes from the Greek, which means wounding. Um, whenever we're wounded, there's scar tissue that forms. And scar tissue is always harder and less resilient and less flexible than the, uh, than the tissue it replaces. When psychological trauma happens, our psyches become more rigid and a little harder and less flexible. It will take time and effort, intentional effort, to begin to work with these young people uh, to be able to co-regulate them through their stress. Uh, uh, rather than, uh, than, than catch their stress and begin to escalate with them. <clears throat> so we need to intentionally connect the conditions of our children uh, with the adversity of both adverse community experiences as well as um, adverse uh, childhood experiences. Two types of, of trauma, real quickly. Um, first is acute trauma. Uh, children who have experienced or witnessed a single traumatic event or episode. Acute traumatic stress is caused by an individual's subjective experience of an extreme traumatic event, which can lead to extreme stress that inhibits a, pe a person's ability to cope. There is no clear division between stress and trauma. However, we know that stress can lead to trauma. These kids uh, or, or people, their symptoms include difficulty with focus and attention, problems with concentration, hypervigilance, feelings of helplessness, often night terrors and flashbacks. Single trauma events uh, can include things like a divorce, a separation, a car accident, uh, anything that can happen in the lives of a, of a child that you're working with uh, that can cause them uh, uh, to, uh, to, to begin to have that stress response. The trauma we're most um, talk, uh, talking about, though, is called <clears throat> complex developmental trauma. A complex developmental trauma occurs when children experience multiple chronic and prolonged developmentally adverse traumatic events, most often of an interpersonal nature and with early life onset. Because the trauma is sustained and occurs in childhood, the impact on, on development is more pervasive and acute. 
These children exhibit a more pronounced deficit in developmental brain-based stress response systems. In terms of both experience and effect, exposure to complex interpersonal trauma is qualitatively distinct from acute trauma. In New Jersey, we're seeing that in our preschools. Um, we have uh, uh, almost a universal preschool in New Jersey, which is one of the coolest things that we do, I believe. Um, but what we're seeing, we had to literally pass a law in our state to not suspend preschoolers, uh, three- and four-year-olds, because we're seeing so much behavior. And our preschool teachers didn't get mean all of a sudden. Uh, the kids that are coming in uh, at that age uh, are bringing in so much stress and toxicity uh, that often I encourage high school teachers to go, go visit a preschool in a tough place, um, and you'll get to see uh, if we don't fix this or start helping this, uh, what's coming your way. Uh, because it's, it's really, you can kind of see the stress response. I like to think of it as, as popcorn, just kids going on and off all day long. Uh, so we see that uh, at very, very young ages. In the face of interpersonal trauma, all the systems of the social brain um, become shaped for offense and defensive purposes. A child growing up surrounded by trauma and unpredictability will only be able to develop neurosystems and functions capable of reflecting that disorganization. And, and the key really is, and what we struggle with in our schools and classrooms, is, is, is the end result. Um, for our most troubled young people, the loss of the ability to regulate the intensity of their feelings is the most far-reaching effect of early trauma. Um, our, what we're trying to do in New Jersey is shift discipline problems in the classrooms and schools um, into regulation issues. How do we begin to regulate these kids? How do we, um, we handle uh, our kids so that we can get them in a state ready to learn? Learn. The brain needs to be in a state of relaxed alertness to learn best. Uh, these young people are nowhere near that state. Here's what they look like. Uh, you'll see on the, on the uh, a healthy nervous system versus a traumatic stressed nervous system. Uh, sometimes the kids are stuck on on. Um, they, uh, they look hyperactive and ADHD, high levels of anxiety, easily panicked, inability to relax, um, restlessness, emotional flooding, uh, hostility, rage responses, or stuck on off. Uh, flat affects, depression, um, deadness about them, chronic fatigue, dis disassociation. And sometimes kids bounce back and forth uh, between those nervous system responses. Uh, so we really didn't come here to bum everybody out today. Uh, so so um, uh, uh, what's the good news uh, uh, about some of this lousy stuff that our kids are experiencing and our families are trying to get through? Children develop within an environment of relationships that begin in the family but also involve other adults who play important roles in their lives. This can include extended family members, providers of early child care and education, nurses, social workers, coaches, police, neighbors, friends. Uh, these relationships affect virtually all aspects uh, of childhood development. Um, so what we do really um, begins to exist um, in, this, in the in-between between self and others. Um, if you look at this slide, um, you'll see a closed in-between space between a self and another and an, open, uh, and an open one. Our work begins in opening that space with the children and people we work with. We know that the resiliency research is quite clear. One sustained connection over time literally changes the direction of these kids lives. It happens in that space um, and we're working with schools to do that intentionally to set up these connections intentionally over time uh, and carry these kids uh, through as long as we have them. If they're in elementary schools one sustained, uh, one sustained relationship through, the, through those years. As we switch them into middle schools how do we make 
make that transition intentionally and reconnect. And then into high school, how do we, how do we make that connection intentionally and connect? So in southern New Jersey, what we've been doing, uh, with the help of Dr. Lori Desitel, who's a good friend of mine and comes to New Jersey at times, uh, we've been creating school-level resiliency teams where we work with school teams for three days. Um, they spend three days with us. Um, and, and the task is for them um, to learn some of those things that we're learning um, and, and uh, to go back into their districts and seed the work. Uh, in their schools and districts. Uh, Lori and I then um, re-meet with those teams uh, in six months. We're collecting uh, climate culture surveys for the kids, the staff, the teachers um, as, as we go, and really trying to create uh, a sense in these schools uh, of what does it take uh, to create good soil for children to grow in. How do we do this intentionally, um, and, and, uh, and how, do we, how do we begin to continue to grow that. So far, we've worked with over 40 districts in New Jersey over the past two summers. Uh, we're extending to another county next summer, and we're really excited about that kind of work, um, and then continuing to support those teams, and support you guys, the teachers that work with these teams. Um, uh, teacher resiliency becomes critical. To be able to sustain the ability to do this work over time, uh, part of the resiliency team effort is really how do we begin to create resiliency in our own staff? Uh, how do we build that so that we can continue to do this kind of work? Um, so uh, I'm going to turn this over to Chief Luzner and talk about some of the other ways we're moving from the school out into the communities. Thank you, Mike. So we're briefly, uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm in my 23rd year law enforcement. Uh, I'm the chief of police of Middle Township. I've been the chief of police for 10 years, and I currently am president of the New Jersey State Association of Chiefs of Police and represent over 400 police chiefs. Uh, my number one priority as president of New Jersey is to raise awareness of adverse childhood experiences and spread trauma-responsive policing and the Handle With Care program throughout New Jersey. Uh, myself and our executive director in a few weeks are going to be at the United Kingdom in Wales where they just trained 5,000 police officers in ACEs and announced a number of partnerships with mental health in schools. And we're hoping that our New Jersey Attorney General, Gabriel Graywall, who I've met with numerous times about this topic, is going to make some of this mandated throughout our entire state. So when I talk about trauma responsive policing, I start with this definition of community problem-oriented policing. This definition is from the Department of Justice. But if you look to other leading institutions across this country, the FBI National Academy or the College of Policing in the United Kingdom, the definition hits these very same principles across all the definitions. Community engagement and getting at the underlying causes or the root causes of crime and social disorder. So when I became chief 10 years ago, I looked to other departments across the state and across the country to see how could we practice community problem oriented policing and get at the underlying causes or the root causes. And we put a number of programs in place, connecting people with substance abuse treatment services, connecting people with mental health services, connecting people with housing services, a terrific partner, Cape Assist. We put a trained social worker in our municipal court to try to help people and connect them with services. And then I get involved with this Cape Regional Wellness Alliance, a grant in public health through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, one of the largest charitable foundations in the world. And it was a small coalition of superintendent of schools, myself as chief of police, me mental health uh, folks. And, and we had to spend $50,000 50, a year over the course of four years for building a culture of health in Cape May County. I reluctantly got involved in this grant but it came to completely change my view about community problem-oriented policing and getting at the root cause. And we came across the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, and I was blown away. I saw the film Resilience, the Biology of Stress, and the Science of Hope, and I said, this is the root cause of crime and social disorder. Those other programs are important, and they continue to this day, and I am proud of those programs. But we need to be focused on trauma in our community related to kids. 
I must admit, I wasn't sure how to go about doing this. Was this, I knew this was in my lane because the definition tells me I should be focused on the root cause of crime and social disorder. But I wasn't sure how to tackle it until I met Mike McKnight, his co-author, Dr. Desitel, Dr. Larry Bentro, Cape Assist brought to our town, and I started to see there are a lot of things that we can do uh, as a police department in our community as a chief of police. So training. The first thing we did is we trained all Middle Township police officers on adverse childhood experiences. Dr. Desitel and Mike McKnight helped me put together a PowerPoint about the effects of trauma on brain development and nervous systems of kids. Every police officer saw the film Resilience, The Biology of Stress and the Signs of the Hope, the film that I was so inspired and moved by. The, this shift amongst officers, I'm not going to tell you, was uh, easy right out of the gate. But one of the things where I, I found that we got a lot of buy-in from officers, and my officers are buying in, and officers across New Jersey, we have pockets in New Jersey right now where this has been spreading since I've been talking about it is to talk about the trauma that police officers experience. We have a huge problem with police officer suicide in this country. I had a police officer commit suicide in 2012. Police officers see terrible, terrible things that human beings do to other human beings. And our officers are struggling with it. In New Jersey, our Attorney General announced a program called Resilience for Officer Wellness. And I asked the officers, when I delivered the training, and as chief of police, I don't deliver training very often to the officers. I wanted them to know that this was a priority from the top. And when I delivered the training, I said, think about the trauma you've seen. Think about officers in our department and other departments that you know have struggled with it, did not have the coping skills, turned to alcohol, suicide, whatever the situation was where they had a difficult time dealing with the things that they've seen, I said, now think about a child. Think about an eight-year-old whose brain is not fully developed, who does not have the support system of a police department, who does not have the support system of family. You chose this career to be exposed to this. Now think about a child that didn't choose any of those things and doesn't have any of those supports. And I tell you, I saw a click amongst the officers. And this program, which is in the process of getting stood up in New Jersey, fits very nicely into this because I think it's so important that our officers are healthy if we're going to ask them to go into the community, much like teachers, to go into the classrooms to make an impact in our community. So the training for police, um, I'm going to blow through some of the stuff. I'll go in, in more detail in the breakout um, at 10.15, but was about the effects of toxic stress on brain development, what's going on in the minds and bodies of kids. We know what is going on in the minds and bodies of kids. And the root cause of why they're coming in contact with us later. And the whole goal of the training was I needed to change the officer's mindset from what's wrong with this kid to what happened to this kid. And if I can get that shift in how the officer views that child when we come in contact with them, they're going to see so many different opportunities than they would not have seen. And I've seen it. You know, when I was on the road and before I had any training, I've had people say to me, you're going to be locking that kid up. Right? That's not acceptable. We thought, what's wrong with this kid? That's not the case. It's what happened to this kid. And we're getting that shift amongst officers. So the training was the first part. The second part is I issued two SOPs on the same day, September 1st, 2018. The first SOP was trauma-responsive policing. I found some information through the Yale Childhood Development Center and the International Association of Chiefs of Police on how we can handle calls for service where kids are present to reduce the dose of adversity, reduce the impact of that particular traumatic event. They read, wrote a whole toolkit that I took and put into a policy. Police officers are on the front lines when a lot of these situations are happening. So real quick, just some of the things, avoid making arrests in front of children when possible. Officer safety has got to come first. Not using children as child interpreters. Uh, when investigating crimes, not investigating um, or interviewing witnesses of a crime in front of children, uh, how to refocus a child, tactical breathing, <clears throat> follow-up visits when possible. I'll talk a little bit about this with our Handle Care program. Uh, police officers are in a unique position, if they do it the right way, to communicate safety. And that's one of the most important things we know when a child is exposed to trauma, um, is how we communicate safety. 
SWAT operations. I was a SWAT commander for five years. I was an operator for 10. I never gave any consideration about a child being present other than could I throw a distraction device in my operation plan and I had to make sure the children and family services were on standby because that's their lane. I'm not worried about that, right? What a dramatic event when a SWAT team goes through the door on a narcotic search warrant. We now have a plan about how we're going to interact with that kid, try to communicate safety and interact in a positive way to reduce the impact of that trauma. The next policy I instituted was the Handle Care program, which is a program through West Virginia. Started in West Virginia with the Attorney General. Our typical communication with a school has revolved around Johnny got locked up on the weekend or after hours and it's going to impact the school environment. We typically did not communicate to the school that Johnny was just present at a dramatic event. If it was something pretty extreme, we would, but the average case where a police officer is making a warrant arrest or going in the home for a domestic violence case, we were not communicating that information to the school. So we issued a, I issued a policy, and this went into effect on September 1st. In our first school year, we had 110 referrals. 110 situations where we made that referral to the school before the bell rang the following day. These aren't kids arrested. These were kids just present at something. And the training was really important so that we could expand the officer's thinking of what was dramatic. Because before we did the training, they would have thought, out oh, a shooting, a stabbing, you know, something really, you know, violent. No, this is a, a wide range. This is an arrest of a parent. This is being in the home for a domestic violence case. An overdose. We're using Narcan on a weekly basis in Middle Township, unfortunately. All these situations where children are present being communicated to the school. Two stories I like to tell to drive home the importance of this Handle with Care program that we had in our first year. My school resource officer at Middle Township High School saw a kid walk through the doors, said, man, something's off with that kid. He had a Handle with Care referral earlier in the year. Unfortunately, a number of our kids had multiple referrals throughout the school year. He went back to our calls for service because we didn't have a Handle with Care referral that morning. And in the calls for service, there was a phone call from Children and Family Services that said, look, so-and-so was removed from his home and put in the youth shelter at 2 a.m. He woke up at 7.30 and walked through the doors of Middle Township High School. The principal didn't know. The teacher didn't know. Nobody knew. Are you going to view that kid completely differently when you interact with them? Absolutely. Absolutely. The second case we had was with my SRO in the elementary number one and two school. A fourth grader walked into the SRO's office. He has a great relationship with the kids, Officer Julio. You'll see a picture of him here in a minute. He said, Mommy and Daddy were fighting last night. The police were in the house. There was no handle with care referral. We went back. We talked with the officers, and sure enough, we were in the house. There was a domestic violence case. But the officers said, hey, Chief, the, the kids were sleeping. The kids didn't see anything. Well, the kids weren't sleeping, right? So we adjusted the policy. We had to learn as we go, make some adjustments. Uh, and that's now being communicated. But will you look at that kid completely differently? Such a simple program, not a heavy lift. I don't think there's any excuse why any police department in this country should not be doing this handle with care program. In New Jersey, the city of Newark is doing it, 2,000 police officers, and we have police departments in New Jersey down to 20 officers that are doing this program. This is Officer Julio. With our handle with care, we try to have that follow-up visit through the SRO, especially with the younger kids. He has lunch with a different group of kids every single day, and they put a sticker on the wall, I had lunch with Officer Julio. We include a kid, a, a kid that had a handle with care referral in that lunch with Officer Julio to have a positive interaction between a role model, um, someone that can communicate safety with that kid without them knowing, right, without them knowing. <clears throat> so the next part that we did, the final piece, was building connections with kids. I said to Mike and I said to Dr. Desitel, I said, well, how do we fix this? How do we make an impact? And they talked about connection and building relationships over time. And if you look at the stuff out of West Virginia at Handle With Care, they have a Handle With Care conference every year. I sent six officers there in October. They weren't thrilled that I was sending them to West Virginia in October, but I said, you know, look, we got to get this information. It was building connections with kids over time and creating that culture. So we expanded our school-based programs. We typically had one program in the fifth grade, which used to be DARE. It's now called Law Enforcement Against Drugs. I changed that to that because it was more evidence-based. But we added a program in the fourth grade called Operation Prevention through DEA. So now we're in the elementary school for the first time over eight weeks. 
We then added another program in the seventh grade through LEAD. And then we added a program in the 10th grade, an opiate prevention program called Hashtag Not Even Once. So we went from one program in the fifth grade to the fourth, fifth, seventh, and 10th. Important curriculum, but also creating that connection with police officers over time, interacting with police officers on a regular basis when there's not a problem, crisis, or emergency. We then put in place a police youth camp. Six day police youth camp in the summertime free of charge. The business community steps up and supports us. Cape Assist and other partners steps up and supports us. We do fun police stuff with the kids, but we just go and do uh, activities with them. We take them to the amusement park and do rides. We take them to the water park. We take them to the zoo and do zip lining. The school can get kids in automatically because we have more applications and spots now. The first year we had 47 kids, the second year we had 60. I'm now maxed at 75, I can't take any more kids. We expanded it countywide with grant funds from the Cape Regional Wellness Alliance that I just talked about. But it's been an amazing, an amazing program. Life skills curriculum is delivered throughout the camp, each day as a theme by Cape Assist, decision making, goal setting. They don't even know half the time it's being delivered. And we also try to promote other activities that they can be involved in throughout the year with that goal of how can we put a kid in a position to have a connection with an adult and a positive role model over time. These are some pictures from our police youth camp, just to give you guys some idea. That's Officer Blake Martindale uh, zip lining with a kid. This is at the Cape May County Police Officer or Cape May County Police Academy. Our prosecutor is a huge supporter. He sent some detectives over. That's Sergeant Mark Higginbottom doing some rides with the kids. That's Sergeant Josh Bryan. I'm not sure what happened there. He got challenged by that youngster to something. I don't know how she's doing that with one hand. We, um, we work out with the kids in the morning for about 20 minutes. It's pretty fun. Um, and then we start our day. That's Steve Novosak in the pool. We have a dive team in Middle Township, just exposing the kids to that. That's Sergeant Brian at PT. That's a picture of the first year of the police youth camp. We do a graduation, National Night Out. Each kid gets a certificate and then some recognition. We do a lot of different awards and this is the Police Academy Award. This is Oscar. This is this past summer. Such an amazing kid. He came up and he shook the hand of every instructor at the end of the camp. When they sat down and said, who's going to be the director uh, award, everybody said Oscar. This kid was just absolutely amazing. Um, his dad, who didn't speak very good English, took this picture but was so proud when I was talking to him at the end of the graduation. This youngster will be back next year. When I put these things together, and I said, okay, how are we going to tackle this ACES thing? You know, I had a spreadsheet. I'm putting things down on paper. How are we going to hit all these things? I didn't see this coming, the impact on the officers. These officers love these kids. And to take the officers out of that environment where they're just interacting and negative call, negative call. If I look at my phone from last night's alert briefing, it'll be nothing but negative calls that these police officers ran from to call, to call, to call. And then they're going to do it again tonight. Right? To take them out of that environment and try to get them po interacting in a positive way is huge, and this has, an ama has had an amazing impact on the officers. Camper evaluations, I'm going to fly through this, but the one piece that I talk about is 7%. <clears throat> Cape Assist is doing a lot of heavy lifting with the data collection. 7% of kids said before the camp they didn't have a trusted adult that they could go to when there was a problem, crisis, or emergency, and now they do. That is changing lives. That is absolutely changing lives. A couple other programs that we've launched recently. Police officer trading card program. We launched this in September. When we did the press release and put it on our Facebook page, we're pretty active on social media. It was our most popular press release we ever did. Over 30,000 views. This was a suggestion from one of my officers that if a kid meets 15 middle downship police officers and gets a card, they can bring it to the station and get a prize bag include with a $10 gift card to McDonald's and some toys from a local arcade. I have kids chasing cops all over town. <laughs> it's amazing. 
I was walked out. I was working late the other night, and I walked out into the back lot, and there was a father and son in the back lot. I said, hey, chief, how you doing? I said, hi, how are you? I said, we heard a shift change. We're trying to meet some officers and get some cards. <laughs> so that's outstanding. I gave the youngster a card. We talked for a few minutes, and they met some officers coming in and out of briefing. It's been really cool. The other thing that we launched this year is gaming and cops. In the middle school, twice a month, kids come in after school. Cape Assist delivers a 15-minute life skill lesson, and we got cops and kids playing video games, appropriate video games, trying to have that positive interaction between cops and kids and build those connections over time. Paul's on patrol program. This is a program in the elementary school, the kindergarten and first grade. Twice a month, we're sending police officers to the school in uniform. They're spending 20 minutes in each class, and they're rotating amongst the classes, just playing with the kids, building those connections um, with kids over time, all part of you know, a comprehensive uh, strategy. This is just not a one-time shot where we're going to go in and do one program in the school. It's the police youth camp. It's the trading car program. It's the programs in the schools expanding. This is our mission. This is our goal because it's connected to public safety and what we know about the research around adverse childhood experiences. Patrols engaging kids. These are pictures that people are posting on our page, parents that are posting on our page of cops and kids interacting in the community, uh, positive interactions. You see officers there on the left-hand side coloring with some kids in a parking lot, playing basketball on the right-hand side. That's Officer Vitola there with some kids that he met that his parents posted on our page. This is a video that was posted on our page two weeks ago. If we can go ahead and roll that, it's only about 10 seconds. On your mark, get set, go! Oh, Fred, I think he's got you, Fred. Oh. That's Corporal Fred Crawley in one of our apartment complexes interacting with kids. The kid challenged him to a race. He said, let's do it. <laughs> I'll end with this. No child says... When I grow up, I want to be human trafficked, or I want to be a domestic uh, abuser, or addicted to heroin, or get arrested. No kid says that. No kid says that. And things that have been said to me when I was for, on the road, and I'm sure to police officers in other parts of the country, you're going to be locking that kid up. That's not acceptable. We can't accept that, that that is the outcome. And the science and research and what we're learning about trauma and how it impacts kids, we can absolutely make a difference. I know we're making a difference in Middle Township. We're not going to solve this alone. There are a lot of partners. I didn't realize all the partners that are working in silos in our community that want to partner with the police. This is directly connected to public safety. This is in the middle of, of the lane as a police chief of how we make our community safer. And we can be a significant piece to bring people together to get to the goal of what Katie talked about. What I want to see is a trauma-informed community, a trauma-informed state, and ultimately a trauma-informed country. It should be our number one priority. So with that, this is our contact information. And we'd be happy. I don't know if there's any time for questions or if anybody has... We have about five minutes for questions if anybody. Anybody have any questions for our New Jersey guests? <clears throat> so I just want to say uh, one thing. I, uh, I would have never envisioned, uh, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, I was afraid of policemen, and f so uh, bumping into Chief Loosner and, 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 and Katie, and, and having schools spread out into their community has been very hopeful for schools. Often we're kind of uh, isolated by ourselves trying to do this work, um, and, and we know uh, that we can impact kids, but we need, we need that support and those webs of support to go out from our building. Uh, and, and it's been uh, uh, just a, a joy to be able to begin to spread that. 
um, not just with these guys. We're in. T uh, uh, we're running around uh, uh, training uh, uh, religious organizations. We did our our chamber of commerce group, our business communities. Uh, we really want to again create entire counties that are that are at least aware of this and what they can do to support kids. Because uh, we're finding uh, most adults uh, want to help. Uh, it's how do we do this? Uh, how do we connect this? Our sports organizations getting this information to coaches because these kids are the ones that can't get to practice or may get kicked off of teams that need that little extra uh, that, that, that we really want to weave together. So we appreciate being able to come out and share with Indiana and, and thank you very much. Uh, uh, we'll be back maybe. So I'm curious about, um, when I think about trauma, I think about everything that's happened in Syria and all of our um, immigration challenges that we're having, and I'm wondering if anyone is addressing that type of trauma in any of our communities, because I know we're getting a lot of children coming into our schools who have more trauma. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we're not intentionally going after that group, but certainly you look worldwide. Yeah. Um, and, and we have, we have uh, kids all over the world that are uh, coming to the United States with significant trauma. Um, uh, the, the, the question is, I mean, it's, the thing that's kind of hopeful is, is really it's about connection. Right. You know, these kids, we all know them in school because usually they're causing us the most problems. Let's face it, I mean, these kids, traumatic, kid, traumatic stress causes behavioral issues. These are our biggest pains in the neck sometimes. Can we recognize that and instead of seeing it as a discipline issue, say, whoa, okay, I know what this is now. How do we build supports and connections over time with these kids? Uh, whether they're from, from other places or, or homegrown, uh, the same stuff will work. And I'll just say, in New Jersey, our Attorney General did issue an Immigration Trust Directive, so municipal police officers are not inquiring about immigration status unless it's a very serious offense. There's a whole realm of offenses. Um, so just from a policing perspective, if we have any contact um, with uh, a child or a child is present in an event and say it's an immigration issue or you know we have knowledge that there was some contact, with law enforcement, we're going to do the handle with care re referral. But um, there are things put in place in New Jersey where um, municipal police officers are it outlines when you can and cannot communicate with uh, ICE. Thank you very much. Oh, do we oh. have another question? Okay, Deanna. <laughs> Yes, all my officers are trained in implicit bias. Dr. Lori Friedel from Fair and Impartial Policing uh, came and trained all our police officers. We wrote a grant in 2014 for that, uh, to receive that. So all our officers have had implicit bias training. Um, you know, there, it, it was outstanding training. It was over the course of three days. Uh, we also did a train the trainer program and all police officers in the academy are receiving that, that training. So it's an, it's an important piece um, and, you know, I'm involved a lot with the juvenile justice um, efforts in New Jersey as president of the State Chiefs Association, and there's a lot of discussion about um, social equity, um, and, and those pieces are important, but I want to start to see the conversation also focus on trauma, right? Go upstream, that, that, that slide that I showed earlier, because um, I believe that's where we're going to have the, the most impact, but it's an important piece, and our police officers have been trained in it. <laughs> 